When you think about the average citizen, what is the path uh, to educating them on the actual asset, on monetary history, on economics? Like, how do you, how far deep down the rabbit hole do you think that the average citizen has to go until the light clicks and they say, oh, I get it. Like, this is something that I want. This is something that I need to use. Well, this is, you know, Pomp, this is the, uh, the, the, the always the big question, you know, because Bitcoin is, is, is not something that you can pick up over the weekend. You know, you really have to think about it for a while and, and think deeply about it. You know, for me, what I always talk about first, whenever I talk to people, is the, the quality of Bitcoin where it's unconfiscatable. Uh, so this is really unique in his, history. Uh, we've never had, a, as a species, the opportunity to have wealth that's un, un, you know, absolutely unconfiscatable. And that resonates. That really, you know, people like that idea. And the folks here who were unbanked, right? Seventy percent of the country before Bitcoin was unbanked. Now, seventy percent of the country is relatively banked, as they all have now the Chivo wallet and they have access to Bitcoin. So that was a flip, you know, an incredible change. And people like that idea. You know, I come up to people come up to me all the time in the street, and they pick up their show me their phone, and they go, "I have twenty dollars." You know, <laughs> like I'm like. Wow, that's fucking awesome, dude! Uh, and, you know, and they know that that they nobody can take that. You know, this is this is theirs. It's, it's unconfiscatable, and this is it can't be inflated away. It can't be taken from the government. Uh, it can't be stolen. It can't be extorted. Uh, and this is significant. Uh, the other thing is that it's uncensorable. So um, this is particularly key for remittances, right? So money going back and forth from El Salvador to the U.S. Uh, this money can go and nobody can stop it. Nobody can can stop that transaction. It's uncensorable. So those those two key points, uh, I think, get into it. People, you know, they're they get some over the hump. They're like, well, you know, that sounds good. Let me try it. Let me download this. Let me get let me get started. So there's a recent uh, appearance by Michael Saylor. Uh, he went and he talked with uh, with Bloomberg and he gave 10 steps that he believes will make Bitcoin a stronger asset. And I want to go through each one of these 10 and kind of get your thoughts in terms of ones you agree with, ones you disagree with, or ones that you think that you can uh, elaborate further on. Uh, the first one is that he says that there's an absence of the no wash trading rule, uh, which basically allows people, if Bitcoin is purchased at 50,000, it drops in price, you can basically sell it, buy it back, you can book the loss, uh, and then continue to hold the same amount of Bitcoin. Agree, disagree, good or bad for Bitcoin? Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought this up. I, I think this is really interesting because Michael Saylor is at an interesting point in his Bitcoin experience, right? Uh, he's now going through what anyone who's been in this uh, space for, like I've been in it for 11 years, right? Started buying it at a dollar. I've been through three halvings. I've been through four, maybe five, 80% corrections. And so Michael is having his first, you know, big you know, cream pie in the face uh, of volatility everyone experiences with Bitcoin at some point. I think his basis at MicroStrategy is 30,700. And of course, they're down, you know, on paper from that. But um, so this list of things he came up with to try to address what he, what he says, what he thinks is uh, could be improved upon. Now, the wash sale trading rule, uh, my, I, I would give that, you know, a, a, I'm fairly ambivalent about that. It's like, yeah, that would be kind of nice, but um, I mean, he's trying to avoid this hyper trading that's going on, uh, people trading without any cost whatsoever uh, into kind of the fastest moving, uh, you know, I'll say shitcoin, I don't know, you know, I mean, altcoin. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of social media where you see hyping of, of, of a meme coin. And so there's no penalty for that mass of meme coiners out there to just jump into a new one. There's no tax penalty, et cetera. So bringing in a wash sale rule would, would theoretically put a buffer between that kind of uh, uh, murmurations, as I call it, my pomp. You know, if you ever look <laughs> up in the sky and you see starlings and the, the flying and they're flying in these fantastic constellations of birds and they seemingly just can can go with thousands of birds simultaneously that's kind of like the altcoin market and all these traders they're hyping on social media and they go from very rapidly from one to the other and they're they're playing this extraordinary game and uh so that theoretically would would kind of put a bumper uh, on that activity so i guess i guess it's okay but but you're you know you're opening the door to regulation so that's where I would say put a caution light there. 
The next point that he made was that there's 520 unregistered and uh, unregulated crypto exchanges uh, that offer 20x leverage. And his point was that this often leads to unprotected investors, which can lead to massive losses. Agree, disagree, and good or bad for Bitcoin? Well, you know, again, Michael is somewhat of a newbie. Uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago when over there at BitMEX, you can get 100x leverage. So uh, 20x leverage is, is moving toward a, a more sane environment than 100x. But um, I mean, obviously, again, um, that kind of leverage is not consistent with uh, the um, kind of the guardrails that should be in place for the average retail in investor. Uh, and so having access to that, it's almost guaranteed you're going to get wrecked. Um, it, it really turns platforms like Coinbase and others, that they become more like casinos. Uh, I've called them casinos before, un unlicensed casinos. Uh, and so it has that element to it where you're, you're, you're really, you know, you're putting up a, a penny and you're gambling on a hundred, on a 20 X or a 30 X. And you, as you know, that type of trading is, is almost guaranteed a loser. Uh, so, I, I mean, he's right uh, in terms of, um, of, of that kind of, um, uh, existence of, of uh, you know, the, uh, as a casino operations going on, uh, he's correct. Again, it opens the door toward regulators. So that's that would be the downside. So the next point that he made uh, was this idea that there's 19,000 cryptocurrencies being cross collateralized and associated with Bitcoin. Uh, and that currently holds Bitcoin back by comparing it to badly managed unregistered securities. Uh, I'm scared to ask you, but agree or disagree, good or bad <laughs> for Bitcoin? <laughs> Well, this is an uh, this is a this is an interesting point. So you know, we've been in this for a while, and that these points are not new. Uh, you know, Michael is just discovering them because you know because this is the learning curve people have. But um, you know, the, the, the everything that's not Bitcoin, as I've said on your show before, would come under the heading of either relatively or absolutely centralized versus Bitcoin, which is uniquely decentralized. Additionally, a case can be made applying the Howey test that everything that's not Bitcoin would be an unregistered security, right? So, and um, it also brings up out the question about Senator Lummis uh, in her bill that she's trying to get through Congress uh, talking about applying some regulations to quote unquote crypto. And she does things like she equates Ethereum and Bitcoin, she calls them both commodities, which I think is false. I mean, you can make a case that Bitcoin is a commodity like gold, but clearly Ethereum is an unregistered security without, without any doubt whatsoever. So Gary Gensler over at the SEC had kind of pushed back against all this and said, hey, lady, you know, stay in your lane. Uh, you don't know what you're talking about, which I think is the correct, correct response. But um, when the cross collateralization issue that he's getting at is really really the crisis du jour, I would say, uh, because of what we saw with Terra, Luna, and all these other DeFi coins, that they're manufacturing that yield, you know, pomp from kind of cross collateralizing and putting money to work into other DeFi coins. And these other DeFi coins are generating returns by, by creating coins out of thin air. So, I mean, by definition, that's a Ponzi scheme. So a lot of that DeFi return is just cross collateralizing into new situations that are creating coins out of thin air and rewarding early, uh, you know, coin rewards, et cetera. Again, unregistered securities. Uh, so you that that that's definitely an issue. Uh, and here, I think that this is definitely a regulatory issue where this definitely would require regulatory um, kind of um, enforcement. And, and you see these things, for example, uh, uh, the, the, in, with Luna, uh, these guys are, are definitely getting into big trouble. I, I believe they're completely prevented from leaving South Korea. They're being held by the police. So, uh, you know, this is, this is definitely an issue. So I think with that, you know, he, he understands that this is what, what's, what's, what's keeping the lid on Bitcoin at the moment is you've got hundreds of billions of dollars. You've got People like Sam Bankman Fried over at FTX, who's become a kingmaker by creating these enormous uh, kind of cross collateralized market making, uh, unregistered, unregulated 
situations where price discovery can't take place. You know, this is something that people talked about a couple of years ago. They said, will Bitcoin experience the same problems gold has? Because there's no good price discovery in gold because of all the derivatives. Uh, and so Wall Street can, can really decide what the price of gold should be, not the market. And what Sailor's pointing out is we're seeing this now in Bitcoin. You've got derivatives or DeFi that are making, creating price discovery for Bitcoin. Uh, and it's and it's 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 blocking it from from a, a more natural price discovery from taking place. So uh, I think he's got an excellent point there. And this is definitely under the wheelhouse of the SEC. They're they're definitely should be enforcing it in this case, and and they're being lax. And it's unclear why the SEC is is being lax. So his next point uh, was connected to this, which is this idea of these wildcat banks, the ability for uh, centralized platforms or, or uh, decentralized in name uh, platforms to actually offer unsustainable yields uh, and kind of gamify uh, or, or celebrate a lot of these. What, uh, what is your thoughts there, good or bad uh, for Bitcoin? And do you agree or not? Well, it's like a, a tag on to the to the previous point, right? It's just that he's just emphasizing the same point. You've got these what he called wildcat banks. Um, these big platforms and they're interrupting price discovery and they're doing so in a way that's manipulative and fraudulent. And it's the perfect opportunity for the, for the SEC to step in and enforce the rules. And so when you start to think about his next point, he listed ignorance and fear of the asset class as a lack of technical know-how still terrifies many, as does media coverage telling of the many supposed deaths of Bitcoin. Kind of the, the sentiment, the conversation, the lack of information being a problem. What are your thoughts there? Agree or disagree and uh, good or bad for Bitcoin? Well, the adoption is definitely tied to understanding Bitcoin. And we know that the more you learn about Bitcoin, the more of a maximalist you become. Uh, nobody who learns uh, about Bitcoin fails to become a maximalist. Only people who really don't take the time to learn about it are left in the camp of a no coiner or a skeptic. But on this point, I think what he's missing is the global nature of Bitcoin. So in the US, which has the US dollar and it has a, a much different culture and the financial markets are in a much different place. This is a bigger problem to get through to people who are bombarded with um, so many things happening uh, in the financial space and the way that that's changing. Uh, it, you know, I look at how, for example, gambling has become legalized with platforms um, now that, that we didn't really have even a few years ago. But if you look around the world, places like El Salvador, the Global South, places like Africa, the, the, the need for Bitcoin is so great that the, the learning curve is very fast. They just get it, they, there's a need for it. And that's where you're gonna see the growth pump. You know, Bitcoin is really very much gonna be the Global South making a move on the Global North. You're gonna see uh, the changing of the guard. Uh, the central banks, the Federal Reserve Bank and the Bank of England, uh, European Central Bank are going to be usurped. They're going to be overtaken by this Bitcoin revolution. And it's going to come from these other countries. It's not going to be led by the United States. So I would suggest to Michael Saylor that he take his message to overseas. You know, get, get take your yacht and sail to uh, a countries uh, that where Bitcoin is adopted and the learning curve is rapid because there's a real need for it. You know throw America under the bus for now because they're just mired in too much other stuff. These other countries, however, it's where it's happening faster because the need is clear and, and the asset is performing brilliantly for, you know, uh, these millions of people and soon to be a billion people and more. He made the point that we don't have a real stable coin yet because there isn't one that is fully regulated and approved. Agree or disagree and good or bad for Bitcoin. All right, this I totally disagree with Michael Saylor because when you're talking about a regulated stable coin, you're talking about a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. You're talking about USDC, the circle coin. You're talking about a Fed coin. You're talking about a surveillance coin. And you're, you're removing one of the best aspects of Bitcoin in, in that the on-ramp would be outside of the banking system, right? Bitcoin exists outside of the banking system 
And it's so when you have a regulated stable coin, you're creating a regulated on ramp to Bitcoin and defeating the purpose of Bitcoin. So that in that in this in this piece that Michael Saylor mentions, I, I, I completely disagree. And I think it goes against the ethos of Bitcoin. This is something that he and I have talked about before. I am 180 degrees in opposition of this idea. So let me ask a clarifying question here, which is uh the regulated stable coin is different than stable coin. Is your thought process that there will be stable coins and people will use them, but they just won't be the central bank digital currencies? Or like, how do you think this plays out? Uh, do you think these stable coins end up all failing and, and nobody adopts them? Uh, and Bitcoin is kind of the last remaining one? Well, Tether is working great. You know, it's the biggest one out there. And um, it, it, they just added the, the Mexican peso and they added the British pound. They have the US dollar. I believe they have the euro. And um, it's, it works fine. And uh, it works for the unbanked. So the tether model is fine. And uh, it will resist being encroached upon by nefarious regulators. And so when you think about that, it's really just the the regulated component versus more of a free market stable coin is really where the difference in maybe you and Sailor's opinion? Yes, I would say that's correct. Yeah, it it, um, it feels like stable coins are going to be a thing, but I think the nuance of uh, free market versus regulated uh, is up for debate, right? So, so that, uh, that makes a ton of sense.